Good evening. Uh, I'm Todd Gannon, as I assume most of you know, and I'm very happy here to be here tonight to welcome Antoine Picon to SciArc. Um, in case uh, you haven't been keeping up, uh, tonight kicks off yet another of those multi-night extravaganzas for which SciArc is becoming, I guess, infamous. Um, so after tonight's event, um, I expect to see all of you back here Friday for the opening of Close Up, uh, curated by our own fearless leader, Hernan Diaz Alonso and David Rue, and featuring work by an array of SciArc faculty and friends and colleagues from around the world. Uh, on Saturday, of course, uh, we've got a uh, main event, the 12th uh, edition up in Hollywood uh, of our annual scholarship fundraising benefit. I'm sure you can still buy tickets if you need them. Um, and tonight also kicks off what I understand is a, uh, a two-night stand in Southern California for Antoine Picon. Uh, so tonight he'll be discussing uh, changing attitudes toward materiality and digital culture in architecture, and tomorrow he'll be building on those arguments as he discusses and signs his latest book, Smart Cities, A Spatialized Intelligence, just down the block at the a d Museum. Uh, so now that I've planned out all of your evenings through the weekend, um, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's guest. Um, first, it's important to know that uh, Antoine Picon went to school for a very long time. Uh, Unfortunately, all of that study took place in Paris, or quite nearby, uh, which unfortunately means that I have no choice but to assault all of you with my horrifying pronunciation of the French language. Um, there's really nothing I can do about it, so let me just preface these remarks with a blanket, je suis désolé for the damage I'm about to do. Um, uh, Professor Picon holds degrees in science and engineering from the Ecole Polytechnique and the Ecole Nationale des Ponts et Chaussées. Uh, he earned a degree in architecture from the Ecole d'Architecture de paris Vignon, and finally a PhD in history from the Ecole des Hautes Etudes and Sciences Sociales. Uh, thankfully, he then came to the United States and is now the G. Ware Travelstead Professor of History of Architecture and Technology and the Director of, the, of Research at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He's the author of at least nine books and enough scholarly essays that I didn't try to count them. Uh, these works mainly focus on the intersection of architecture and technology, as well as on the systems thinking, which has been a kind of lingua franca at that complicated intersection since the 17th century. Um, his earlier books, such as French Architects and Engineers in the Age of Enlightenment, or his book on the invention of the engineer at one of his almas mater, uh, and his book on Claude Perrault, the French theorist who attempted to systematize the classical orders and defended the modern position in the famous querelle between the ancients and the moderns, all examine the paradigmatic shifts involved in the adoption of Enlightenment thinking into architecture culture. His more recent books, including Digital Culture and Architecture of 2010, Ornament, The Politics of Architecture and Subjectivity of 2013, and Smart Cities, published in French in 2013 and in English last year, all focus on the implications of the sort of systems thinking associated with digital technology on conventional notions of disciplinarity. <clears throat> Picon's work on digital culture and on the changing notions of virtuality and materiality that have been among the effects on that culture has been particularly meaningful to me. Uh, not only have his texts been useful in helping me sort out my own thinking on these topics, but one of them helped me find my way out of a jam I found myself in soon after I started teaching here at SciArc in 2008. Um, that year, Dora and Ming invited me to teach a course on tectonics to the second year MARC 1 students. Uh, I, of course, reflexively turned to Ken Frampton's magnum opus on that topic, Studies in Tectonic Culture, as the main text for the course. But I quickly came to realize that Frampton's book, though fantastically dense and interesting and useful in its presentation of the historical development of tectonic culture, didn't seem to have anything to say to the kind of work we were and are developing here at SciArc. In fact, Frampton's book in many ways seemed opposed to the sort of stuff that we were up to here. So I needed a counterpoint, and I started digging, and I quickly found one. And, in Picon's brief article, Architecture and the Virtual Toward a New Materiality, which was published in Praxis in 2004. 
Um, as I put these introductory notes together, I, I pulled up my notes from back then, and this is what I wrote about that text a long time ago. Um, Picon lays out a sober tally of the pros and cons of the digital, constructed in large part as an answer to criticisms by Ken Frampton that the digital represents a threat to traditional materiality and tectonics. For Picon, the digital highlights as many similarities with, for example, the existing virtuality, the already existing virtuality of architecture, the role of representation, etc. Highlights as many similarities with, as well as differences from, including new focuses on flows and effects, traditional practices. That sentence reads better when you don't say it out loud with all the parentheses. Uh, architecture's materiality, then, is not threatened by the digital, but rather expanded by it. Rumors of the dissolution of the discipline are greatly exaggerated. New possibilities, not threats and limitations, abound. So that text, Architecture in the Virtual, was a perfect answer to Frampton's more traditional position. In a way, it allowed me to stage my own querelle between the ancients and the moderns, with uh, Antoine standing in for Claude Perrault against Frampton's uh, Francois Blondel. And uh, for me, anyway, I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, But more importantly, it gave me the opportunity to share with my students an example of the kind of rigorous and ultimately optimistic writing and thinking about architecture's entanglements with systems thinking and technology that has characterized French writing on architecture from Perrault in the 17th century through Durand in the 19th to Picon in the 21st. I look forward to hearing yet more of that rigor and optimism tonight. And so I'll get out of the way so we can welcome Antoine Picon. Thank you for very much. First of all, I have to say your French is splendid, whereas my English is problematic. But, you know, I suppose I don't have the choice. So in what sense can we say that the digital is truly a revolution for architecture? There are, of course, various possible answers to this question. One may, for instance, insist on the novelty of the geometries that we can produce with the help of the computer. Many forms of current use today would have been quite difficult to define rigorously before the generalization of the computer. One may also, and this has become a more and more common answer in the past years, insist on the new relation between design and fabrication that are emerging. This evolution explains the planetary success met by experiments like those led by Fabio Gramazio and Matthias Kohler at ETH Zurich. I was happy, by the way, to learn that your robot's arm are not orange, uh, which seems to be uh, the norm pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, It is also possible to interpret the change that are going on as a first step toward a new and integrative approach of the design process and the various theorists of parametric design, beginning with Patrick Schumacher, uh, are proposing the interpretation of that latter sort. So the path that I would like to take today is slightly different. It is perhaps more epistemological insofar that what I'm really interested in is how the very fundamentals of the architectural discipline are affected by the development of digital culture. I think actually, I don't know whether Frampton is an ancient, actually I believe he's an ancient, but uh, I think he's right in assessing that yes, architecture is changing a lot. Uh, He doesn't like it. I think it might be more interesting than what he says usually, but the change is real. So an epistemological uh, path, uh, also an approach that is permeated with an historical dimension, and this that lasts at at least for two reasons. The first, and you mentioned it, was that I began my career studying what had happened in engineering, architecture, as well as in urban uh, design and planning at the time of the first industrial revolution. I was actually interested in the multiple ways in which spatial change, social transformation, and technological evolution intersected. And for me, the reason perhaps I've spent the past 10 years working on the digital is because the digital represents a mutation perhaps as important 
as what happened at the turn of the 18th and 19th century. So it's not always that as an historian you have a revolution going under your eyes. So that's probably why I spend so much time on those things. Second reason for this historical dimension is that the digital is actually the last stage in a process of change, the roots of which are actually to be found in the last decades of the 19th century with the development of information-based societies in countries like the United States, Germany, the United Kingdom, or France. For example, we talk a lot about big data today as the new hot topic, but big data has been with us for a very long time. It started actually at the turn of the 19th and 20th century with the rise of welfare state, giant bureaucracies, multinational corporation, and mass production structure. This is, for example, are the offices of the Prudential Company at the end of the 19th century, and it produced a ton of, in of data. So it may seem paradoxical to state that the digital is a profound revolution, and to affirm at the same time that it's partially the result of a more than a century long evolution. But I think it's, there is nothing paradoxical in it because for a revolution to be truly profound, it must be marked by rapid change, but also by the existence of long-term trends that led to this change. If you take the American or the French Revolution, they were both climactic and the result of very long evolution. Otherwise, you know, this uh, a revolution is not so significant. Now, my presentation revolves around the key notion of materiality, which, I, uh, which is a notion I've used, you know, uh, in, the, in various articles, as well as in the three books on digital culture in architecture and the urban that I've written uh, recently. So also present in, these, in the, my writing, especially in the book that I devoted to the question of ornament, is the question of architectural expression and even symbolism. So this is where the language thing comes from in the title of this lecture. Although I don't believe that architecture should be approached as a language, I'll come back to that, I believe that the question of language, or more generally the symbolic, is unavoidable at some point when thinking about what architecture tries to achieve. This is why I've put a reference to it in the title of this lecture. So I've made a tremendous effort not to repeat myself, which is usually what scholars love to do, but uh, try, to, try to reframe a little bit and elaborate a bit more on what I mean by materiality, the relation it has to the question of expression, and above all, how it might enable to better grasp what is going on in the development of digital architecture. So the notion of materiality uh, that I'm, I'm going to try to present differs from others insofar that for me, materiality is not another name for matter. It has rather to do with the relation we have with matter. It is also inseparable from the question of the symbolic. So in order to approach this notion, I'd like to start by the successive understanding of what the computer is about that have marked the past 50 to 60 years. So there again, a little bit of historical perspective. First, uh, let me remind you that the computer was basically about computing. And this is what appeared at the beginning, and this is an advertisement for uh, the US Army, and we have the ENIAC, the first big electronic computer, and that was actually something that computed. Then, of course, came the realization that computer could perhaps think, and this is the time when artificial intelligence began, and let's note, by the way, that this is a rapidly re-emerging dimension today. I'm really struck by the fact that, you know, after the digital fabrication thing, the next step might have to do with what do we do with artificial intelligence in the design world. But then, the rise of, the dig of digital culture was marked by the increasing realization that the computer and more generally digital technologies were reshaping our experience of the material world. And movies like Minority Report were already very much about this phenomenon. They announced uh, 
key development like tactile screens. I remember the first time I saw, I remember at the GSD, a student doing that. I had no iPhone at the time. I was wondering what is the person thinking of? And then, you know, a few years later, it's a perfectly evident gesture for every, everyone. So the idea that really there is a reshaping of our experience of the material world that is going on, and that goes beyond the massive spread of computer chips, of sensors, of the development of wireless communication, all these evolution that we usually summarize speaking of, you know, pervasive computing, all that kind of thing. So smart cities, the subject of my latest book, are part of this reshaping. So, the, so my real starting point will be that the computer and digital culture have indeed transformed the way we perceive and understand the world, beginning with the sensory. So I'd like to evoke now some of the characteristics of this new experience of the material world. So the first thing, and I'm sorry, I um, belong to a generation uh, that used to think that images were not zoomable and clickable. But we live now in a world in which zooming is a perfectly natural thing, zooming in and out. The power of 10 uh, vision of the Eames has become a, a reality. And uh, we perceive, by the way, at both extreme things which are strangely similar. I'm always struck on how, you know, on a satellite image of Los Angeles, it looks a little bit like the crystallization of concrete, uh, on the other hand. So we don't perceive forms anymore. We perceive textures and colors. So we see differently. More generally, we perceive differently. And behind that, more general evolution uh, are happening uh, that concern the way we conceive the world. For example, there again something that today is absolutely evident, there is no longer an, a clear opposition between the abstract and the concrete. Code appears as immediately related to sensation, but also to matter. Uh, actually, these are the code, this was a coding of the first notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, but it's pretty evident that this is abstract and concrete today are very often in communication. So the idea that code and matter are not separated is a very powerful idea these days. It has inspired many designers through notions such as material computation. And, uh, you know, here, for example, an experiment regarding the use of ceramic elements by Jenny Sabin. To arrive at this, uh, you know, it mixes advanced computing techniques with an intimate knowledge of the material, and it looks like a perfectly now uh, uh, common types of endeavor. Uh, something also very striking for an historian is that for centuries there was an opposition between the computational and the organic. And this is something that has been completely suspended. You know, uh, computers are actually completely bridging that kind of opposition. This is an art, and one of the early artificial plant kind of artistic installation, um, artistic proposal by two artists, Sommerer and Mignono. But you know, I could also show a picture by Carl Chu or whatever. So even more striking, you know, the way somebody like Akim Mengus, for example, is inspired by organic life and processes. Here is probably one of my favorite things, in which he starts from the way certain spiders live in the water, weaving inside air bubbles. And from that, he, he uh, has this idea of a pavilion. I don't know what to think necessarily of the aesthetic, but it's definitely, you know, quite typical of what's going on today. So more generally, the world that surrounds us seems to have changed. It's populated with all kinds of association between, for example, atoms and bits uh, that do not possess exactly the same characteristics as former substances and phenomena. This is what we call often augmented reality, but it's actually the entire world that falls under this category, and smart cities are fundamentally based on augmented reality. What I'd like to point out is that it's a world that is not without contradiction. For example, you know, I'm always struck by how we are so obsessed by continuity, you know, fields, uh, defor uh, de continuous deformation, etc., while using discrete tools. And you know, for me, this is the big, one of the big paradox of our vision of the world, that it's all about continuity, and it's all about using tools which are actually discrete. 
about discontinuity. By the same token, speaking of material computation, etc., you have this very widespread discourse today about you know, merging information and matter. Information is matter and matter is information. But you take the blue rabbit here, the information is actually dramatically separated from the matter. And actually, most of the time, what the digital has done is actually to separate information from matter. And we have this huge nostalgia of them merging again. But this is very often, in 3D printing, a nostalgia. So at this stage, what I'd like to argue is that it's not the world only that has changed. We have changed. For we perceive and understand ourselves in the same movement as we identify something that is exterior to us. So we have changed. I won't go into all the details. You know, this is, after all, close to Hollywood. But we are becoming cyborg-like. And Hollywood has completely accustomed us to think of that. But what is striking is how more, even more disturbing is reality. For example, when this first bionic arm was experimented, you know, these changes, a lot of things we used to believe about what's prosthesis, what separated prosthesis from uh, the uh, human, genuine human body. So uh, another way probably as disturbing is uh, the idea that, you know, we are uh, Less, it's probably less spectacular, but probably more disconcerting in philosophical terms. The fact that we're becoming networks or environment-like. This is the network of a young Somali girl on Facebook. I like the illustration. But in a way, you're not living anymore only in your body. You're pretty much dispersed, spread throughout all the connection that unites you to the world. And at the same time, strangely, trying to regroup yourself. Uh, what I found also very striking is how full of contradiction we are. You take the cyborg, our cyborg identity. We've never been as cyborg and at the same time as nostalgic of a kind of human authenticity. We've never been as spread beyond our bodies and at the same time trying to regroup ourselves as the hero of our own life. I'm always struck by the fact that Facebook statements are about that, you know, saying, hey, I'm myself and I'm so different from you guys, but we're simply a few billions doing that. And tattoos are also part of that thing. The age of social networks is also the age of the reemergence of tattoo as a mark of I'm so separate and so unique in the urban jungle. So a way to summarize that would be to say that you know, we have changed, the world has changed, actually, because nature and the human subject are always co-constructed or co-produced. And there are, of course, multiple ambiguities between the two. And this is what Bruno Latour has dubbed the constitution of hybrids in We've Never Been Moderns. Actually, what I don't always understand with Bruno uh, is why is he surprised? Because actually, we've always been both, uh, you know, we've always both created the idea that there is something natural and there is something human, and actually, with the reality that we're always co constructing the two. So they're always hybrids. So my argument at this stage is to say that architecture is affected by this process of change. And I think it's quite evident from the couple of examples I gave, the work of designers like Sabin Mengers, and I could have put many others, is quite emblematic. But I'd like to start, and this is something we talked about tectonic, uh, to more immediate aspect of this transformation in the architectural field. So I'll go back to a number of things that really struck me again and again today. And the thing that, by the way, uh, Kenneth hates so much. So the first thing is that traditional notions such as scale seem more and more problematic. And computer screens form seem to float without definite scale. I was really, I remember the first time I saw this picture by Francois Roche, I was wondering, is it a close up of a giant sponge? Uh, and when he told me, no, it's a mega structure, okay. But uh, actually forms are a bit scaleless. Uh, and this goes further, actually, than really this question of the screen. I'm always struck by the multiplication of transcalar design techniques 
that we see today uh, in a number of practices. It, doesn't, it does not mean that scale is no longer relevant, but scale is no longer granted. Scale used to be something absolutely evident for a 19th century architect, was still pretty evident for the generation of Le Corbusier and others. I think today, we, one of the things we have to do when we design is to ask ourselves, how do we define scale? And this is not given. This is something we have to work upon. So to go back to something that was mentioned in this very generous presentation of my work, tectonics or structure is equally affected. What is striking, it's not only that you know, a lot of buildings seems to have no clear uh, tectonic identity, but actually the idea of legibility is challenged. You know, you, you know, some 30 years ago, this would have looked totally horrific. Let's be clear. Uh, so there is something going on in this challenge of the idea that structure was about a certain type of legibility of design. Something else is going on. There again, doesn't mean that there is no longer a tectonic, but it needs there again, it's not a given, it's there again something we have to work on. Meanwhile, the seamless or the superficial tends to take precedence in many cases on the classically articulated. This opens new possibilities, of course, like the rise of the ornamental or the spectacular development of fabrication as an alternative to traditional tectonic thinking. I'm really struck by the way how fabrication, the discourse on fabrication is actually these days substituting itself to the discourse uh, on tectonics that used to be dominant. But what I found equally surprising is how fabrication is very often ornamental, deeply ornamental. You know, grammatio on color, but he, even here. So ornament might be, after all, one of the way we explore the new physical world that surrounds us. And with there again surprising things, for example, categories, you know, the, in the 18th century, uh, you know, early modernity was about opposing structure to ornament. The structural was not the ornamental. Today, if you take practices like Christian Quérez, uh, it's all about the possibility that, after all, this is neither a clearly st structure nor ornament. It's a hybrid between the two. So this is now that it's going to get bad because I'm going to go into some general consideration on all that. What I'd like to note at this stage is that both scale and tectonic had to do with two very fundamental operations uh, for architecture. The first one was about ordering matter. We tend to forget sometimes we're so much into our own architectural discourse that one of the first things that architecture does is actually to put some order into matter. And the second is to make it expressive. So through proportion, scale was about both ordering and making expressive. In the Vitruvian tradition, it was supposed to convey a mix of physical and symbolic impression. For example, like the column was a way to order matter, but it was also the becoming, in the case of the ionic column, the becoming like a woman's body uh, of the column. Structure was also about both, actually. And this is something for me, uh, Peter Eisenman magistrally demonstrated that with Domino. A domino is actually a strangely expressive archetype. It is expressive, actually, through the use of a sena per angolo, you know, this kind of very specific perspective that was used a lot in the 18th century for theatrical stage. And there is something theatrical in Domino. Uh, it's something that is used by uh, the Bibiena family or Piranesi. It's also expressive through the play of mass and shadows. You know, the shadow of the staircase is very dramatic, etc. So the point I want to get at is the idea that more generally, architecture is about ordering matter and animating it so that it can address humans. And one could also talk about meaning, you know, which is very often considered almost you know, as you know, a catastrophic uh, term today, but I would like to rehabilitate it. Or even language. Architecture is, could be a discipline that orders matter so that it's almost about to speak. <laughs> 
But let me be clear, I'm not suggesting, you know, going back to the idea that architecture should be a language. Uh, if architecture begins to speak, it's too late. It becomes highly problematic. So you have, in some ways, all the paradox of the relation to language is that it should be almost about to speak, but of course when it speaks, it's already too late. It's no, it might be no longer architecture, and that was probably the postmodern mistake. So it's a longing for language, if you like. But despite this kind of mistake, I still believe that the symbolic is unavoidable in architecture. But again, it's not a matter of frozen symbols like the words in a dictionary, like they were borrowed from a dictionary. Architecture is about a becoming symbolic, not a being symbolic once and for all, like a frozen meaning. So another way I'd like to put it is to say that architectural expression enables matter to be organized as a frame, and we find this notion of order, that makes human action meaningful. And for me, uh, but that's a French idiosyncrasy, I'm still fascinated. This is actually the two final engraving of the first French treatise ever published in architecture, a guy called Philibert Delorme. On the left, you had the bad architect. And the bad architect is, you may, he's roaming, he has no, and you may note, by the way, it's about architecture, and it's about the body of the architect. The bad architect has no eye, no hands, and he's roaming in a catastrophic medieval uh, setting, and the wind is blowing, you know, there are, there are bones on the ground, so it's really horrible, uh, and so shouldn't do that. But then we have the good architect, so you're not necessary. The good architect, for those who are really close to the picture, is even, not only has he two eyes, but even a third, the eye of wisdom. And he's engaged into a dialogue with a disciple, so it's about teaching, etc. But look at the settings. You know, the architecture is ornamented, but the architecture seems to be participating to the dialogue, whereas the castle is standing on the left, aloof, and all by himself, doesn't talk to anyone, just like the architect is completely solipsist. On the left, on the right, this is all about dialogue, about make, making a meaningful frame for the action of the architect. Okay, so, so that was my French moment, uh, because I really like these two pictures. Uh, and I like especially, I have to say, for the ornament thing, you have the cornucopia on the building and the cornucopia in the middle of the natural setting, and it's as if architecture and architectural ornament was about appropriating the productivity of nature. I could go on for ages, but let's stop there. So what I'd like to do at this stage is finally to say what I call materiality. So what I call materiality, if we take the idea that there is a, 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 a co-construction of the human and the non-human the, the non and the human, what I call materiality is the sub-process in the simultaneous emergence of the non-human and the human, of nature and the human, if you prefer those terms, that deals more specifically with a relationship we have with matter. So my argument is to say that actually materiality is not matter, it's a relation to matter. It's a, the type of relation we have to matter, materials, etc. All these things we consider as physical. So a good metaphor of that, and that's back to my 18th century origin, something that always fascinated me, and sorry for this thing there again in French, is the Treatise of Sensation of Condillac which has a very weird, is a sensationalist philosopher. He does something very weird in the 18th century. He imagines a statue without any sense. A statue that is, has some degree of consciousness and intelligence, but has no, uh, cannot see, cannot smell, cannot touch, etc. You would think that the most crucial, and he give the five senses to the statue one after the other. The most crucial moment, actually, contrary to what would have been the case before, is not seeing. It's actually the touch. And this is the second page there. There is actually half of the volume is about what touch does to the mind. And the idea is that touch, it's meeting with matter and seeing that matter resist. And then because you see that matter resist, you begin to be become self-aware. You are not the physical world. You co-construct yourself and the physical world. This is something that haunts the entire second half of the 18th century, 
architecture. For example, Boulet and his famous theory of simple bodies, etc. It's about the co-construction of the mind and uh, matter. Uh, it's almost, you know, this giant pyramid is almost like a frugal gift, you know, something that is supposed to help you construct yourself. And there is this deep belief in the 18th century that through organizing matter, architecture actually structure the subject, the human subject. And this is a very powerful idea at the time uh, that will remain powerful, for, uh, you know, throughout the 19th century. So with the idea, with that, we could say that the relation between matter and humans are partly given. I don't want to suggest that a wall should not be a wall, but also partially constructed. They are constructed through our actions or tools or knowledge uh, or beliefs. So which means also that materiality varies from one culture and one period to another, and that it's constructed through a series of means. For example, and it has been studied a lot by historians of science, when Galileo points his telescope towards the moons and say there are mountains on the moons, you know, this is a revolution at the time because the vision of matter that prevailed was that matter was irregular, you know, on Earth, but in, in the sky, everything was regular, smooth, perfect, etc., etc. So a world in which imperfection, irregularity, is to be found everywhere, the only regularity being in the mathematical structure of the world, changes completely the relation we have to the physical world. So science, scientific instrument play a role. Technology probably even more. I'm still fascinated by the car and all the things that the car has changed. And also the relation between the car and the construction of ourself. You know, I'm always struck by the fact that we all belong to a society in which I, if I tell you close your eyes and imagine that you're accelerating in a powerful car, you can immediately see what I mean. You know, if I had said uh, something like you can feel the acceleration in your bones to a 17th century person, who would have wondered what is the guy talking about? So, and if I tell you, you feel the power of the engine, you're powerful, etc., most of you will understand what I mean. And if I tell you, and then, oops, there was a crash, and you get completely crashed, you will also understand it. The very specific mix of empowerment and vulnerability that we feel in our body in the mechanical age is something that is typical of this kind of co-construction of the material world and ourselves. So our systems of belief, so science, technology, systems of belief, our systems of belief have something also to do with that. Something, um, you know, I worked also on the 19th century, I have to confess, spooky 19th century. I'm always struck by the fact that ghosts in the 19th century are far more material than they are today. You know, because you could photograph them and actually measure them. You know, there are a lot of people measuring auras, phenomenon, et cetera, in the 19th century. It's a typical photo. Um, the English guy who specialized in photographing ghosts with their, the, you know, dear departed with their family. Uh, so today, nobody would really believe into the, that. But ghosts were more material in the 19th century. So for me, architecture has fundamental, fundamentally to do with matter, and above all, with materiality. What it does is to order matter and to animate it so that it can relate to humans. Simultaneously, it cannot but raise the question of how can human relate to things made of matter, and not only to materials, but also to machines, to this material world that seems so far from the mind. I'm always struck by the fact that architecture is actually one of the disciplines that constantly asks itself not only what is the relation between matter and the human, but also what do they have in common. So architecture is not the only discipline that does that, nor has that question emerged recently. Uh, you know, this is, of course, you know, um, digital fabrication goes with that, but you take the uh, Diderot in the 18th century, Diderot is completely obsessed by that question, what is common between the world of the mind and the world of material processes, machines, etc. And this is why he writes so much about the arts and craft in the encyclopedia. And of course today, this is again a question uh, 
you know, when, in an age in which neurosciences, the perspective of artificial intelligence, etc., are everywhere, this question of what do we have in common with the material world is more than ever returning. So my argument at this stage would be to say that we could write a history of architecture that would be a history of shifting materialities. For example, you take the Renaissance. The Renaissance is clearly about a different way to order the physical world. And you know, we all know that the perspective is linked to quantification, to the idea of measure applied to objects, all these kind of things. And of course, this is inseparable from the construction of a new subject that sees the world uh, and order the world through uh, the power of his eye. So you could write a history of Renaissance architecture like that. You could write a history of 18th, the 18th century transition also under the same kind of thing. So my argument is really that you know, the digital by the end is contrary with a new shift and trying to make sense of it. So uh, it raises question, as I said, of how to think about building when scale is not granted by traditional mean, how to think about controlling matter when traditional tectonics is often not relevant. There are also unaddressed or not so clear question how, for example, you know, we have new objects like temperature gradients, all these strange things that the thermodynamic approach of buildings is beginning to uh, put before, before our eyes. How do we integrate these things into architecture? Of course, it looks like a Zahadi project, but once we say that, uh, we are not that advanced. So sustainability is not only about you know, uh, criteria, quantification, etc. It's all also about extending the realm of what we consider as material things, material phenomenon. This is actually an object for architecture to today as much as a pillar or a wall. So, and how to make it expressive, which is the question like of the, that designers like Philip Ram have tried to address, even if their reflections uh, remain necessarily lacunar at that stage. The rise of a new materiality is inseparable from questions of affect and pleasure. And this is where the evolution of the human subject comes again in the foreground. For me, one of the big limits, by the way, of the discourse on affect in architecture is that very often it seems completely impersonal, as if it was completely uh, something that had nothing to do with the question of the country uh, subject. And ornament, and more generally the ornamental dimension, even sometimes close to the grotesque, have become a, a vector for the exploration of the relation between matter and humans. So towards a new materiality does not all imply all, only a new understanding of matter. It's not only the new materialism that so many books of philosophy are describing. It means a new conception of matter, of course, but of, also of ourselves, and, and above all, of the new relation we have with matter. So at this stage, let me try to summarize some of the points that I've made and uh, that may differentiate me sometimes from other uh, theorists and historians of the digital. The first is really the idea that we have to take seriously this idea of co-production of the non-human and the human, that we cannot be only talking about materials. I'm really struck, for example, Akim Mengus, you know, when he does his pavilion, very often he put a girl at the end in the middle of the pavilion to, take the pavi to photograph the pavilion. But the pavilion is about people, you know. And uh, so what is the kind of relation between the digital, uh, between human and non-human, that is happening today? Not fetishized matter, but envisage it always in a relation with the human. It's also inseparable from questions like the interior, what is an interior today? Should we imagine home for cyborgs, home for post-humans, etc.? Another question for me is the symbolic. And that's for me a very important question. Uh, there is no materialism which can avoid completely the symbolic. And let me be clear, what I'm trying to say is once again, it's not a matter of frozen symbols. I'm, often, I'm always struck by the fact that the Karyatid is of course an interesting proposal about architecture. But it's hard to imagine, you know, in the Erectaean you have a few, once you cannot imagine a hundred Karyatids. 
it becomes kind of ridiculous or Las Vegas, you know, almost bad Las Vegas, not interesting Las Vegas. So, uh, what's the problem of the karyatid? Is that in some ways it's frozen. It has become a female body, and once you have that, it's no longer clearly that evident to do some architecture with it, except. If you're a genuine Greek working in the, at the, in the age of Pericles, but later on it becomes problematic. The Cariatides at the Louvre are a catastrophe. The Ionic column, on the other hand, is not a fully accomplished uh, body, it's a becoming. And I think it makes the difference. Just like, you know, if you look at classical architecture, even more than the isolated column, it's the pilaster, which is the fundamental element because the pilaster is the wall becoming a column. So to think of symbolism as a dynamic uh, emergence rather than a frozen uh, thing. To think also of symbolism as uh, related with the question of memory. Architecture has to do with memory, something that is often forgotten in contrary architecture, that's my hometown in Lyon, that tends sometimes to produce objects that seem to have landed on Earth like spaceship. And by the way, I'm not thinking only of Coupe Moblo because I think the green cube is a different spaceship, but uh, by the end, you know, there is something going on that is a bit problematic. Actually, I do prefer the Coupe Moblo by the end to the green cube, but that's another story. Okay. So there again, it doesn't mean that we have to go back to all the, you know, the traditional monumental, etc. And in that respect, you know, God knows how I'm not always enthusiastic about Eisenman projects, but I have to say I still very much like the, uh, the Berlin uh, Memorial because it's both a super abstract thing, but at the same time that is weight with a kind of question regarding memory, what have we forgotten, what do we remember, etc., which seems to me uh, quite an interesting proposal. So, I'm almost done with this lecture, but I like actually to, I reserve the most important in my eyes for the end so that you get completely spent. Uh, so that's the last thing I'd like to deal with which is perhaps for me the most fundamental issue, it's the one I have the greatest difficulty to explain usually, uh, which is related to what I call very often the paradox of architectural form. And the relation it has with this question of materiality, of course, and digital culture. Form, I have to precise that the GSD, I'm a great friend of Scott Cohen, so I have nothing against formalism in general, but form is completely fetishized throughout the world. And star architecture, I don't know why, I was in a Zahadid mood, uh, but, um, but I think it's a good example. Uh, form and star architecture is to a large extent about this. And I remember uh, Van Ber Ben Van Berkel in his first book, Move. I'm, I'm, each time I meet with Ben, he's always surprised because I actually read his book which nobody almost did. And then I each time explain to him that historians read books, even designers' book, and they're very often deserving to do that. But nevertheless, there is this famous statement in this book that you know, form is becoming a little bit like fashion design. So you buy a building like you buy a dress. And at the same time, why do I say this is paradoxical? Because at the same time, the traditional status of form as synonymous with the reassuring perman permanence of an object is challenged by a number of factors. The first one is that computers are interestingly dyna dynamic machines, and they produce actually a whole spectrum of possible solutions. And even if you find an optimizing procedure to finally convince yourself that this was the good instance, there is still a choice to be made. And, and hence, for me, the fascination of the Marais-like type of picture, as if, in a way, the final project was not a point of convergence, like, you know, in the, tra the traditional vision of architecture, but just a cross-section at a given moment, or is still in a process that could go on forever. And for me, the artificial intelligence will probably reinforce that, because I'm Pretty, I'm ready to bet, actually, since I will be probably dead at the time, you know, there is no danger. But let's say in 30 years, uh, we might very well 
C intelligent machine who can produce family of very convincing solution to problems well stated by architects. But then what architects will do will be actually to choose. And speaking of choice, let me remember, let me remind you that one of the basic paradigm of information is that you know you have an urn in which you have white or black bowls, ball, okay, and you pick one. And information is, have you picked a white or a black? And this is what a bit of information is. So all that to go to this idea that information is actually not a thing, it's actually an occurrence, something like an elementary event. And what I'd like to, and actually the, and you know, her, our whole vision of nature is actually more and more uh, white Hadian, if you like, inspired by a kind of pro, uh, uh, you know, uh, underground whitehead-like philosophy. The world is not populated with static object; it's populated with flows and occurrences and events. And you know, and this is what emergence is very much about. Emergence is event-like. And speaking of information, I always find striking that the first thing one saw on the first type of screen ever connected to a computer was not actually things, it was situations. In the SAGE system, the anti-aerial system of the Cold War, what was seen were things that could happen or happen like nuclear strike, that kind of thing. So where do I want to go? To the idea that you know, one of the things that is mutating is probably that matter is not no longer necessarily a question of object. It's a question of occurrences, events, situations, scenario, that kind of thing. By the same token, architecture might be something that happens instead of being. You know, we've thought of architecture since the Renaissance uh, as uh, something synonymous with re the very essence of what is. And what if architecture actually was something centered about, around something more unstable that has to do more with emergence, operation, etc. Which was, which is for me actually one of the things star architecture has done. We believe that it's all about form, but the Guggenheim actually is more an event than a traditional form. It's something that happens, that triggers different scenario, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea behind that is to say that the digital, the world of information is not a world of things. It's a world of, of uh, situation, scenario, occurrences, et cetera. Architecture is no longer about presence, about the reassurance, reassuring presence of being. And there again, to go back to Eisenman, I think it's for me interesting that Eisenman had that type of idea and that someone like Eisenman, after all, did his, his, his uh, PhD in a place where actually people were beginning to work with computer in Cambridge at the time with Leslie Martin. So the idea is to say that form is no longer about being, architecture be, uh, you know, being the manifestation of a permanence, but about action. Because uh, that architecture becomes something more commensurable with action, which is for me the root of the so-called performative turn that some theorists have evoked uh, in the past years. So an architecture of action uh, with the idea of a commensurability of architectural form with action rather than being might be perhaps the most formidable challenge for the architectural discipline in the digital age. Architecture laying actions rather than object with a new relation to space and time. Uh, so I'm not sure that this is Aravena's idea of the news from the front, but I find very typical that, you know, when I arrive at the GSD, what was prevailing was a kind of cynicism, you know, a kind of neo kulassian cynicism. It was all about becoming a global architect and building as many things as possible in China. The GSE today is a very different place. There are a lot of young architects who want to save the world, so which might be another illusion. But what is very striking is the idea that architecture should make a difference, that it's a form of action. So let me just go back to an old idea, actually, because not everything is new in this affair. Schinkel famously said that the architects were the ennobler of human relation. 
And it's revealing that one of the key images in his presentation of his Altes Museum is precisely this one. It's not about form, really. It's about what form does. It triggers things like education. And you have a, in the, in the, on the left a father showing or a big brother showing to a younger person a work of art and explaining. It's about friendship. It's about the relation to art. It's about a lot of things like that. So, what I would suggest is that architecture, more even than producing action, is about pr producing situation. That architecture, and what the digital should bring us to, is actually an architecture that really br fosters situation, the potential of situation. So let me finish. I chose to finish with an image which is not high tech, but an image of my colleague Rahul Merotra, which is not a beautiful project in the traditional sense, but what the building, this is a building for you know, a high tech company in India, but one of the things the building does is because of its Indian smart facade, which is actually a tended garden by low caste people, is actually to oblige the higher uh, in the social hierarchy people inside to be in visual contact with people they don't even see usually. So for me, there is a kind of striking analogy that's to say this is about producing by the end situation. This is about an active architecture. And this might be what the digital forces us to really consider more centrally than before. At the time of Schinkel, it was still possible to consider that it was a side effect of form. But perhaps form is a side effect of this architecture producing situation. Thank you very much. Thank you.